just few days ago i was um, in a college in delhi about roughly 400 students and when i went to that event just as it happened here they invited me to the principal's room and we were having a chat and in the middle of the chat a young girl with a camera she walked in and uh, i stopped her and asked her what are you doing i am doing my ug in psychology so i asked her she is in second year i asked her suppose after you finish your second year you ask your principal now i want to take one year break i want to go and learn classical music for one year and come back and continue my education will your principal permit you to do that she very hesitatingly but courageously said no my principal will not permit and that is the kind of status that we have today where if a student wants to do something there is not much freedom the system is like that it is not the fault of that college or the fault of that principal it is the system which has restricted the opportunities to the students most of you have raised kids i mean the faculty members here the students might have seen small kids in your houses in your relatives places etc and what what did you notice every child is different they behave differently they play differently they think differently they do differently but somehow we all assume that when they reach adulthood they all become identical and in our colleges and universities we try to use one fits all measure and try to see whether you are good or bad so we have killed this differential nature that exists and we are trying to force enforce a kind of uniformity which is against the nature of human beings and that's the biggest challenge that we have in our educational system have you seen these small kids when your house is just whitewashed and you are very happy that the house is so clean and the small kid comes out with a colored pencil and goes and scribbles there and what will be the reaction of the parent the parent will come and say hey don't do that you are spoiling my while uh, wall but from the child's perspective she wants to see what will happen if i scribble there to this white wall she wants to explore and uh, here you see the child for the first term for the first time in life when the parent comes and tells that i had to conform to things i have no freedom to explore myself somebody tells don't do this or don't do that i have to conform to that this is the biggest challenge that young people like you will face in your life at every stage somebody or the other will keep advising you you do this or you don't do that we need to come out of this conformity mindset the other biggest challenge that happens with our educational system is the standardized testing each student has enormous potential within themselves and we want to measure this potential but what do our teachers our academicians do they use the standardized testing i am not against standardized testing we all need to know how much cholesterol i have how much blood pressure i have we need standardized testing for that but for testing the potential of the students you want to use standardized testing that is another disaster that we have committed in our educational system three things 
not recognizing that every student is different and therefore we must provide personalized education to the students. In olden days, the class sizes were small, the teacher could sense the differences in the ability of the students to absorb the knowledge and alter the way things are taught to the student. But today, we have so many students, humanly you may think it is impossible to give personalized education. But that situation is behind us. We can use technology to provide personalized, individualized education to suit the potential aspirations and the goals of the students. And it is happening already. We need to scale it up. The other thing that we need to do is encourage the students to question the status quo. Don't make them conformists. They should be able to think critically. If a teacher is explaining a theory on the board, the students should be encouraged to question that, not simply follow because the theorem itself is an authority or the textbook itself is an authority. So how can I question the authority? That is the end of your pursuit of knowledge when you think that you, you cannot question the authority. Learn to stand on your legs. Learn to critically think and keep questioning the status quo. And the other thing that we need to do in our educational system is because we have a large number of students in our educational system. Today we have 30 crore students. And out of that only 4 crores are in the higher education system. And in the next 5 years it will become 8 crores. This classroom will not be sufficient to accommodate the double the number of students who are wishing to pursue high quality higher education. But we need to provide the education on a mass scale. You are all very privileged a lot. You got admission to this great institution. You have parents who can support you to pay the tuition fee, your living costs. But think about crores and crores of other young people of your age or younger than you who are living in rural areas who are living in families whose parents may be a daily wage worker or a small farmer struggling to get food for twice in a day. What about those students? Is it not our responsibility to ensure that the same high quality education is taken to the doorstep of those crores of students who are aspiring to become like you? That is why we need to ensure that the education is done on a mass scale. It may appear contradictory that on one side we want to provide personalized education so that your real potential comes out, your learning outcomes are enhanced. On the other side, I am saying education also has to be on a mass scale. Let me tell you, because you are all in management area, if we provide high quality education on a mass scale to a large number of young people, it will enhance the average, the aggregate competency of people, young people in the society. When the aggregate competency is enhanced, it will lead to enhanced productivity. When the productivity goes up, our economic systems will become stronger. The per capita income of the individuals will increase. The per capita wealth of the individuals will increase. And that will then help us to put in more public funds to take education to large number of students across the country. So therefore, it is in the interest of our country that we provide education in such a way that your individual potential is recognized and enhanced and it is reached to large number of students across the country.
let me also tell you um a simple uh, example um is there anybody whose birthday is coming in this month or next month can you please raise your hand huh. no i want a student not you <laughs> anybody next month or next to next month assume one of you uh, yes let's say his birthday is going to come and now many of you know that his birthday is going to come and some of you may think that we will you will take him uh, for a treat on the birthday and you take him for a treat you go to a mall and there are three nice restaurants there and uh, he is called for a treat so his mind says okay let me go to restaurant three but then you have invited him you sense that he wants to go to restaurant three but you want to take him to restaurant one you say no 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 let's go to restaurant one only your friend says now suddenly you realize that your autonomy to make a decision is curtailed you can't make a decision what your friend says you have to go there and this is what happens to many of our kids many of our students the student wants to pursue something in political science but the parents want him to do computer science so your autonomy is curtailed in our educational system okay you go and choose restaurant one and uh, your friend uh, offers you a plate of idli and a cup of coffee and uh, you tell your friend that no first i will have idli i will take a break go and do some window shopping and then i will have coffee your friend says no 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 you should have idli followed by coffee i am treating you so that is what is happening if somebody wants to do a sci- from psychology course you want to shift to music or you want to shift to some other subject your teacher your system say no that's not possible just as your friend is saying and then to your horror you find that that particular restaurant it offers only idli and coffee nothing else so this is what is happening to our younger people like you you lack the freedom to choose the subjects that you want to study you lack the flexibility even if you choose the subject that you want to study within that duration you completely lack the flexibility because our system is so rigid and then you have no choices friends that is why the national education policy wants to ensure that every young person like you have three important ingredients necessary in education freedom flexibility and choice don't you like to have that yes or no if you want to say yes you say yes or no yes no i don't hear it loudly yes so that's the lesson to the teachers here they are all saying they want freedom they want flexibility they want choices teachers are you willing to provide that to our students teachers are saying yes i hope somebody has recorded video recorded what teachers said you can show them next time that you have agreed to provide freedom flexibility and choices where is it okay now one of the things that um, you keep to you, you have to keep in your mind is when i whenever we look at any challenge any problem you should have a bird's eye view of the problem but then you need to break that problem into smaller parts and look at each part and see how you can find a solution the reason why i am telling is when you are studying in a college like this it's an idealized world you are away from the rest of the world nice campus nice hostels nice friends so many activities but the outside world is not so ideal it's a non ideal world and when you pass out and you go and see you see so many challenges you get perturbed and this is where 
you need to have a clear understanding that the world is always complex. Our life is always a struggle. But how, whether you can succeed in this struggle depends on how you respond to these challenges. You need to prepare yourself to respond to these challenges. And if you want to do that, you have to be an optimist. You need to think big. You need to understand what are your inner potentials. Use them and respond to the challenges that you are facing in your life so that you can navigate easily. And this is what happens when we are looking at so many suicides taking place on the college's campuses. So many students undergoing the stress. It is because you are unprepared to see the real world. You are living in a very, very idealized world. And it is the responsibility of our educational institutions, our teachers, to sensitize you to the real world. So why do you have to be an optimist? Optimists, they enrich the present. They enhance the future. They challenge the improbable. And they achieve the unachievable. And that is the only way we can succeed in our life. Now, having said that, in today's situation, if you look at any challenge that we face, when you go from your campus to the main city, what is the main challenge you face? You see traffic, you see pollution. And it's not a localized problem. It is there across the country, it's there across the globe. And what we call this pollution issue and so on, it's related to climate change. And you also see, when you go out into the city and into the countryside, you see that there are many people who are facing extreme poverty. Not everybody is as fortunate as you are. Who are facing what is known as multidimensional poverty. Multidimensional poverty means they are not in extreme poverty. They have food and shelter, but then they don't have access to good health facilities. They don't have access to good education. They don't have good transport. So they face multidimensional um, poverty. So these are the kinds of challenges that you see when you go out of your institutions. Since we are living in a society, we are not individuals who will get a degree, who will get a job, raise a family and live happily. If you want to live happily, there are so many others who are providing you that ecosystem. So we are all interdependent on each other. So therefore, as students, when you pass out, when, when you are growing in your career, it's also important for you to think about this interdependency on each other. Every action that you are doing, every work that you are doing in your life, it is affecting somebody else. And that is why, students, my fervent request to all of you is to be responsible not only to yourself, but to the, to the people around you. Through your actions, you need to create a positive change in the lives of the people around you. And that's the only way, through st small steps that each one of us do, we can address the challenges which are affecting us as a global community. Today, when we talk about climate change, it's closely linked to the destruction of the biodiversity, the deforestation, the desertification, land and ocean degradation, pollution, and so on. And each one of our activities are contributing uh, to that. Today we are struggling to keep the global rise in temperature below two degrees centigrade as compared to the global temperature of pre-industrial era. I was pleasantly surprised uh, to hear that this campus is designed uh, to be a green campus. 
I was taken to the library there and I was shown there are no artificial lights here. We use natural light to sit here and work. And that is how we need to change our lifestyles in order to protect ourselves and protect the environment that is sustaining us. When I talk about the national education policy and the various kinds of reforms that we are bringing in, these are all tools. But what is required for all of us is use these tools to transform ourselves, to transform our mindset, to transform our thinking process. We should not just focus only on the tools that are there, whatever reforms that are coming. But we need to see why we need to implement them and how it is going to change the lives of each one of us. Just to give you one example, I will give a quiz to you, to the students. It's a multiple choice question. There are only two choices. Choose A or B. A. I will give you a pure metal, let's say iron. Iron, you know, a pure metal is ductile, it is corrosive, it is not very strong. Choice B, I will mix in iron, a little bit of chromium, a little bit of magnesium, a little bit of silicon. What will happen to iron? Iron will now become steel. Steel is very strong. It has lot many applications as compared to iron. So, my dear students, I want to ask you, if I give choice A and choice B, which one will you choose? Loud. You choose B. I am hearing from the teachers loud, not from the students. You choose B, right? You, you, you choose an ally which is stronger, non-corrosive, which can be used in many applications. Look at your own lives. Suppose you try to be like this pure metal. You choose physics in your class 2. Go to BSc, choose physics, MSc physics, PhD physics. You are like this pure iron metal. You are pure, but you have limitations. On the other hand, imagine that you have chosen physics in your class 2, but in your BSc, you have chosen some other subject, and in your MSc, you have chosen some other subject. Just as this soft metal has become stronger, it has transformed itself into steel, you will find that there are many takers um, who will use your knowledge, your multidisciplinary knowledge. And that's the reason why we have been now telling all the institutions that you should ensure that our students do not become pure metals. They should become allies. They should become experts in multiple areas. Just to give you an example, let's say during COVID period, you wanted to develop a model to find out how the COVID is spreading. If it is left only to biologists, that model will not be able to predict. If you leave it to only mathematicians, it cannot. What you need is a person who understands the biology part of COVID, a person who knows the mathematical part, and you also need an understanding of the society. You require a sociologist there because you don't know a biologist and a mathematician cannot understand how clusters of people are responding to vaccination or how they are responding to um, lockout. Only a sociologist can tell you. So. That's the reason why in the national education policy, we are emphasizing that multidisciplinary education should be provided. There are many things in the national education policy. Since we have limited time, I will take only a couple of things and through illustrations, I will try to tell you why it is important for you students, why you should be demanding every day, go to your principal, your director and say, where are the choices for us? Where, are the, where is the freedom? Where is the flexibility? This is what you should be doing. Now, when I talk about multidisciplinary education, this, of course, will enhance your employability. 
um, it will provide you better opportunities. But however, when you talk to the director of the institution or a vice chancellor, um, the vice chancellor will come up with all the challenges uh, he has or she has. Um, but there are simple solutions for introducing multidisciplinarity in the lives of our students. First of all, I'm glad that Usmania University has broken down these disciplinary boundaries and they let undergraduates in any discipline to join in a postgraduate program of any other discipline. That is how it should be. In fact, I would like to go down a little bit. If I have, for some reason, I have chosen commerce, but now in my schooling, and now I want to shift over to physics, or I want to shift over to um, something else. Why should I be prevented? If I can prove my competency in, a, in an entrance examination, I should be allowed to study any subject that I may like to pursue. How can you expect a small kid to make a, a lifelong uh, choices at that age? The choices can change, but unfortunately our system doesn't provide uh, that kind of opportunity. And now, suppose I have joined in BSc Physics, a four-year undergraduate program. The national education policy says that allow the students to major and minor in different subjects that they, they would like to pursue. You may like to major in physics, but you can also minor in economics. Then at the end of it, you will become econophysicist. You will use the physics models to solve the problems of economics. And this is how we can provide multidisciplinary education. You do, most universities have economics, physics, chemistry, and so on, multiple departments are there. What prevents the universities letting the students attend courses from different departments. And I, I would like to congratulate Usmania University for taking the first step in implementing this. But I, however, at the same time, let me also tell you, Professor Ravinder, uh, when I travel across the country and meet people like you, students and educationists, and when I listen to them, in many places, I also hear the heads of the institution saying that ours is the first institution we have introduced this. So I see a kind of competition across the country to say that, no, we are the first we have introduced, which is a very, very healthy trend that many universities are coming forward to introduce this uh, multidisciplinary education. Purely from the student's perspective, without your active involvement, we will not be able to implement NEP successfully. You are the real saradhis of this national education policy. That's why um, UGC has introduced the NEP Sardis scheme. And uh, I'm sure there are some Sardis from Usmania University also. We have selected about 720 Sardis. And these Sardis uh, will conduct webinars, seminars, exhibitions, and so on, and bring more awareness. See, in the beginning, when we announced the NEP 2020, we were um, at a stage of understanding NEP and cre creating awareness. But now we are at the stage of action and implementation. And I hope that um, Usmania University and in your college also, if there are any Sardis, you will work together to make sure that um, the NEP 2020 is implemented uh, effectively. Professor Ravinder also mentioned about uh, the multi-entry multi-exit uh, scheme. I do understand uh, the apprehensions of some institutions about this multi-entry, multi-exit scheme. Um, we have already implemented this, I think it's more than one year. In many institutions, we have already implemented it. One of the fears that was expressed to me is that if you introduce this multi-entry, multi-exit scheme, a lot of students will drop out they will take in course advantage of this multi-entry, multi-exit, and they will drop out. I think this is, this is a grave underestimate of the capabilities and the aspirations of our young people like you. Um, we have not heard across the country in the institutions where multi-entry, multi-exit is introduced, 
we have not uh, heard about large scale migration of students or seats becoming vacant and so on. Multi entry, multi exit scheme is primarily introduced for a couple of reasons. One, if any student is unable to clear their examinations, let's say at the end of second year, if the student wants to take a break for some time, maybe because of health reasons or financial reasons or personal reasons like not able to complete some examinations, unfortunately that becomes the end of the journey, educational journey for the student. Primarily because our systems are so rigid. Now, think about the fate of that student. When the student goes back, there are relatives, there are peers, there are friends. They all think that that person is a failure. He, he left the college and then came back home. And this mentality of looking at every such thing as a failure and attaching a negative stigma to that is actually affecting our young people. It is so natural to fall down. It is so natural to fail in many things that we do. What we need to do is encourage students to learn from these failures and then move forward. This multi-entry, multi-exit scheme is primarily to remove that kind of psyche that we have in our minds, um, that failure is somehow bad. Failure should be a stepping stone for each one of you. The other reason why we have introduced the multi-entry, multi-exit scheme is, you know, at the end of second year, some institutions may have vacancies. Now, every seat that goes vacant is a national wastage. There are so many aspiring students. How can you let these vacant seats go? Can't you have literal entry of students? Can't you devise your own admission process and bring students into your vacant seats so that they also get benefited? And often, it may also happen that there is a tier 3 institution a student would like to move to a tier 2 or tier 1 institution because that institution has better teachers, better facilities. We will be providing an opportunity to the students um, through this multi-entry, multi-exit scheme. So therefore, we believe that this multi-entry, multi-exit scheme should actually benefit the students and also the institutions. I heard uh, at many places that uh, the university system has much weaker alumni cells. They do not have the connection with the uh, alumni who are passing out of their institutions. We often hear about the alumni of IITs and such other institutions walking in and then giving a check for 20 crores and say, no, for what my institution has done, I'm giving this as, um, as, as a financial fund uh, for the growth of the institution. But we never think about the university system. Our university system has enormous talent, enormous potential. If you look at the number of unicorns established in US alone, I'm not telling globally, in US alone, if you see, there are many state universities which have produced alumni who have contributed to the establishment of unicorns in US alone. In the rest of the globe also, there are many, many university alumni who are contributing. But what is required is to establish a connect with them and bring them back to your institution, show them around, take their inputs, and involve them in the growth of our institution. And that's the reason why, as part of NEP 2020, um, we have requested all the universities to establish this alumni cell. And again, uh, I'm pleasantly uh, surprised and happy that Usmane University is uh, contacting their alumni and involving in the growth of the university. And that is how it should be done. But uh, Professor Ravinder also has said that from your college, he has learned and then he has introduced four-year undergraduate program. So it's vice versa. We learn from each other and we benefit from each other. You know, when we look at the education system nationally, often the focus is on IITs, 
institutions of national importance. Out of 4.1 crore students that we have in higher educational institutions, only 6% of the students are in these national institutions. The remaining 94% are the students in the state universities and the colleges that are spread across the country. We need to strengthen the state university system if our educational system has to strengthen. And there are two components that we need to do. One, of course, is to improve the teaching learning processes. And then strengthen the research ecosystem. I will take up the second one first. Whenever we want to strengthen the research ecosystem, the issue of funding comes. In the last one week, I was part of the Niti Aayog meetings discussing on the same topic of strengthening the research ecosystem in our universities and colleges. Generally, when we talk about research ecosystem, we think of the funds. Um, we do not have enough funds to do research. That, of course, is, is a challenge. You require funds. But we need to look at things beyond the funds. Let's say somebody is very weak and uh, uh, he sits under a tree grasping um, you, you what thoughts will come to you immediately? Okay, let's go and give some food and water so that that person will recover. But there may be several other things because of which that person is weak. Um, university system also is like that. Simply pumping large amount of funds to the university system alone will not help the university system to strengthen. There are other things that we need to do and often, our attention is not focused on those things. For example, research funding is always highly competitive. Nobody gives you research funds on a platter and say, you can do any research that you want. Now, if it is competitive, are our faculty members trained enough to write successful project proposals? Point one, even if I am succeeding, Close to 20 or 25% of the applications are successful in project funding. Even if I am successful, I get, let's say, 20 lakhs, 2 crores, 5 crores funding to my university. Next comes the elephant in the room. That is the administration. The administration is so insensitive to the needs of my young faculty who has brought 2 crores of funding. The young faculty will only be running around the files, pushing the files. So first, our faculty had to be trained to write successful project proposals. Two, we need to set this system within our universities. We need to make it more efficient so that the, the project purchases, the implementation of the project, they are not hampered. And then the other one, even if I am doing some basic research, I lack the competency to convert this basic research into applied research, into a prototype. And most universities, if you want to have university uh, industry linkages, this is what the industry looks for. Do you have the competency to turn your basic research into a prototype? We don't have, so we need to strengthen that. Even if I convert that into a prototype, how do I interact with the researcher? Your focus is going to be on publishing papers, for example, um, creating new knowledge. But the industry person says, no, 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 no. You can't publish that paper, so, so on. That knowledge has to be first converted into a product. And then I should be able to sell it. Only then you can publish it. So you can see the cognitive distance. This cognitive distance has to be uh, broken and you need to come up with some via medium so that both of you are able to talk to each other at certain agreeable wavelength. The other challenge, this is something that I am sharing my thoughts with my colleagues who are researchers in different domains, is the communication channels. How do you establish the communication channels with the industry? Is it through formal channels? 
is it through informal channels. Often, globally, it is found that informal channels help you in, pro in transferring this tacit knowledge from one to the other. But however, we lack this kind of informal channels. How many of us, for example, are there any industry representatives here in this meeting? None. There is no industry representative, right? Very few. One. One or two are there, right? Three are there. Four. Four are there. But here I think we have more than 100 people here. We have four. We need to have many of them in conversations like this during tea time, or during breaks. You have conversations and you build that trust in each other. And that is what will establish better university uh, uh, industry collaborations. So my request to all of you is please do that. How many of you have joint workshops? If Usmania University organizes a workshop on some topic, let's say in biotechnology, you may invite other faculty members from other colleges and universities, but also ensure that at least 25% of the participants are from the industry so that there is a mutual dialogue between you and that chemistry develops. Chemistry is very, very important between industry colleagues and the university colleagues. So that's the reason why we have asked all universities to form R&D cells. And the purpose of R&D cells, we have provided the guidelines to the universities to ensure that some of the things that I have mentioned, shared with you, are implemented in the universities. And let me tell you, uh, when we had a review meeting with these R&D cells of nearly 700 universities, many of them are excited about how R&D cell is now transforming the research ecosystem uh, in the universities. In the UGC, we are also thinking about recognizing three best R&D cells from across the country um, so that others also will get motivated and improve the research ecosystem. And um, for improving the teaching learning ecosystem in the universities, there are a couple of things that I would like to share. Number one, from the student's perspective. Students are always eager to learn something. They are always eager to experiment something. They don't want to be conformists. They want to be critical thinkers. They want to be solution providers. They want to take risks. Encourage the students to do that. And how can you do that? Well, a couple of things that we need to do. There is a shloka which goes back to the Mahabharata times. This shloka tells that one-fourth of education comes from the teacher, one-fourth of the education comes from critical thinking, one-fourth of education comes from peer learning amongst yourself, and one-fourth of education comes over a period of time through experience. So now you see the entire educational process, the role of teacher is only one-fourth. And that transformation has to come in the minds of the teachers. I am not a teacher. I am a mentor to my students. We need to come out of this teaching. I, have, I want to teach my students. One of my young faculty members, he came and said, Sir, how to become a good teacher? I said, don't become a good teacher. You need to become a mentor to your students so that the best in your students is brought out. They become the best learners. That should be the goal of our uh, teachers. So now you see, if the students have to learn through their own experience, how do you create such an opportunity to your students? Introduce internships. Let the students go out of your colleges, interact with the real world, learn on the floor, learn by talking to real people in real world. These internships had to be introduced. Earlier, when we spoke about internship, we thought, if I am in engineering, I will go to Intel, I will go to Microsoft. Now UGC says, as per NEP 2020, don't get into those narrow areas of internship. 
if you are an economic student maybe you can go to a local court and see how a court functions if you are a computer science student go to your local panchayat office and see technology how technology can bring positive changes changes in the lives of the people you need to go beyond your own domains to expand your life experiences and then peer learning how do you engage your students in their peer learning and this is a challenge for the uh, students in your classrooms do you do you stop your lecture after 15 minutes and say students i'll give you 3 minutes talk to each other i do that in my class and you can see the nice level going up young people they are restless you can't expect them to sit fight all the time they are always moving around let them do it for 2 3 minutes so after 2 3 minutes when i say okay now let's come back to the lecture there is no sir just wait we are busy talking to each other so you need to create situations inside the classroom where students are learning uh, from each other and you must encourage the students to challenge you in the classroom how many of you feel comfortable when a student challenges you in the classroom this is something this attitudinal change is something that we need no i have seen only few hands i want every teacher to say that i encourage my students to critically question me in the classroom i am not saying all the teachers are raising students be ready with your cameras <laughs> right so this teaching learning component is something that um, we must encourage uh, and improve in our uh, educational systems thank you thank you very much uh, for this wonderful opportunity